Hello, my name is Jackie Schertz, and welcome to this program of Hey Listen. Our topic today is American Sign Language, the preservation of our language. Joining me is a special co-host, Brenda Aaron, and our guest, Dr. Ted Sapala. You will be fascinated by our discussion today. We plan to be very honest and talk about ASL, American Sign Language, how we use it, the attitudes that surround it, the misconceptions about ASL, and we'll be right back. again. Thank you for joining us on Hey Listen. I'd like to introduce first my special co-host. This is Brenda Aaron. She's from a deaf family and she's a sign language instructor at NTID. She developed a course that was specifically for students to develop their skill using ASL. It also was to discuss things about deaf culture, the deaf experience, etc. With us today, our special guest is Dr. Ted Sapala, who teaches at the University of Rochester. He is also from a deaf family. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to start out with American Sign Language, ASL. Could you give us some background on that? Sure. ASL, American Sign Language, is really a new term. It's, it's come into existence, say, 20 years ago. And before that, most deaf people just called it the sign language. And it was thought that there was just the one language, just the sign language. But 20 years ago, researchers started investigating the language and clarified the term, and it's called American Sign Language. And this is used by deaf people throughout America. And this language has its own history and its own evolution. I would like to add that Dr. Ted Sapala is a professor of linguistics. And he does a lot of research related to ASL classifiers, which is a particular morpheme in the language. Um, ASL has been changing over the years, I believe. Is that accurate? Well, one of the problems is knowing what ASL looked like years ago. How can you write signs? There's really not a lot of historical <coughs> documentation of ASL. Now I think some people are looking at ways to write sign, but fortunately, some signs were recorded through film around 1910 and we now have a record of deaf people signing on film and yes you can see that it is different than today modern signing but you can still understand it do you mean that it's been changing slightly has it been a lot of change a drastic change through the years has sign language been along all along 
Well, I think we have to separate two issues here. What has really changed, for the most part, has been the actual signs itself. But the syntax or the grammar, the order of the signs, has remained the same. Oh, I see. So does ASL have parallels with English? Is it the same type of language? Well, first of all, you have to understand that American Sign Language was not invented or, or derived from a spoken language like English. No, in fact, it has its own evolution, its own history. And it's true that sometimes you might find things that look the same. And, and that's also the case for two foreign languages where you might find the same uh, concepts expressed. So what ASL shares with English is the same that it does with other foreign languages. So what about French, Spanish, German? Is ASL more like English or more like French or another language? Well, you have to understand that if you understand what makes up a language, the rules and so forth, you'll find that you'll find parallels between f different foreign languages. But then again, you may find differences in the structure of the language. And, and I think researchers are now interested in understanding what is the same or universal across languages. And most of this work has been done with spoken languages. And, and they have found these universals and also language-specific rules. And only recently has the research looked at spoken at sign language and also drawn the comparison between sign and spoken languages and we are finding many of the things are the same as we've been doing research have you discovered that it's more like a specific language is it more like mm. english well i i think things are changing quite a bit first the conclusion was that asl was similar to chinese but then People thought it was more similar to Russian. So really, and, and I myself can't really answer that question specifically, but I think you can't really say it's the same as another language yet. Some people have commented that fingerspelling is not really a natural part of American Sign Language. Is it a part or not? Well, I think that's debatable because some people think that just the mere use of fingerspelling is English. But if you look back historically where fingerspelling comes from, it comes from Spain some 400 years ago. And it was a manual alphabet used for spoken Spanish, and then that was borrowed to France. and. And it has actually gone through different countries. And it's funny that fingerspelling is really the one system that seems to represent the spoken language. I, if you compare to writing and all other systems, it seems that fingerspelling is really the one that is the most explicit and clear representation, word for word, from English. But what about the influence of fingerspelling or the incorporation of fingerspelling into ASL? Well, I think it's important that we look at how signers fingerspell. It's always for nouns, names of people, places, and so forth. But other parts of the language are not fingerspelled. I heard that some people use fingerspelling for emphasis. That's Is true. that right? That's true. Signers often, just for emphasis, just to make a real impression, like, but, or what? OK, do you call that fingerspelling really a loan sign or a borrowed sign? Well, not always just for emphasis. Let's compare a borrowed finger-spelled sign, like what, W-H-A-T. There's another form that's borrowed that is more reduced and compressed. And it actually begins to take a form that looks more like a sign, like what, do. 
And these were once fingerspelled, but have now come to take the shape of a formal sign. I think for your information, the principles of ASL with loan signs, ASL bef before had words and they were fingerspelled and now they have become signs. Like no good is NG now and it's, it has this form of a sign. We were asking if they're very similar, if they're similar to emphasizing. And Ted has just clarified that no, it has become a sign. But let me also clarify, why would people use fingerspelling? Does that mean that ASL is, is just inadequate, it's not rich enough to, to invent new signs so it has to resort to fingerspelling? Well, that's not the case. There are many ways we can invent new signs from within the language. Say there's a new term that we need to come up with. You know, we're not the only language that borrows from other languages. Many spoken languages borrow from foreign languages. So it's not surprising that ASL borrows from English. Okay, fine, thank you. When you watch someone who's using American Sign Language, you can also often identify them as a native user. And you know that they're using that from as their native language. How can you tell these things? Well, I think the term that you just use, a native user of the language, there, let me clarify here, there, it's not the case that all deaf people know sign language. First of all, we have to say that some do. And then if we look at that group of people who do use sign language, we find that there are many, there's a, a great variation in the background of when they learn to sign. And in fact, you can see that the age at which they were exposed to sign language. You know, there are even people who, as adults, say, oh, I didn't know. I, I've been out here in the world all this time. I never met another deaf person. And wow, the sign language is great. And, and they start using it from that point on. Or there's other people who were born into deaf families and started signing from infancy. So the, ca the group of people that I had just referred to, those who were raised using ASL, are the group of people that, that we call native signers. But there are many people who learned ASL at different times in their life. And maybe they learned English first and then learned American Sign Language second, or um, they may have learned American Sign Language first early in life. So it's true that it's the category of people who did learn it from infancy from their parents. That is the term native user of the language. But now y you're asking me how one can identify a person as a native signer. Well, you can see that many times people will say, hey, you, are, are your parents deaf? They can sort of, they can tell by their signing. And, and most of the time they're right. They'll, they'll be able to tell. And in fact, re research has shown that <coughs> deaf people have that intuition and can guess when a person is a native signer. And, and I think that this group of people, the native users, are, are different than other signers. And what is that difference? <coughs> it's a very subtle difference. I think you have to be fluent in sign to be able to detect this different. And some think that maybe it's more facial expression or more signing, but that's not what it is. In fact, it's, it's a more subtle, their facial expressions are, are used with, with a mastery. It, that defines a native signer, really. I see. Do you find varieties in the language depending upon which coast you're on, whether you're in the east or the west? Yes, there are dialects of American Sign Language. <coughs> oh, I need to tell you we need to take a break right now and have a message from our sponsor. So please sit back, relax, and be with us in a moment. <laughs>
Welcome back. We're discussing ASL with our guest, Dr. Ted Sapala. So we ended the first part of our show talking about the dialect differences around the country. Yes, in fact, there are dialects throughout the country. Most of the variation we find, though, has to do with just a particular sign, and, and you'll know that, oh, you must be from that part of the country because you use that sign for that particular concept. But as for the grammar of the language, we find that uniform throughout the country. It's interesting. I was wondering, I've noticed it myself that in the East, people use a lot more expression and mouth movement. But on the West Coast, it's different, and in the South, they sign more formally, it seems. In other areas, it's the speed is faster. Well, can you tell where I'm from? <laughs> You're obviously from the West. <laughs> I'm from the West, but I haven't really been able to see what the East Coast is like since I just got here. Rochester, is that East? I've just moved here yes. recently. It all seems the same to me. Yes, yeah, some people <coughs> look at me and say that I must be a native New Yorker. But, well, I guess you're f it's fading, so Rochester must be from in west. <laughs> so the native characteristics related to dialects, how do, how do they influence each other? Well, I would say from the work I've been doing on ASL, I've been uh, focusing more on the west coast, and I'm now learning more about the East Coast uh, population. Maybe we can answer that later. Okay, did you want to say something? No, go ahead. All right. Before, when I met with you in your office and we were talking about this, you said that many deaf people now who are involved in the professions and gaining higher levels of education and higher degrees um, how does that influence their, their use of language? I know that they tend to use a lot more English. And currently, there are a lot of hearing people who are getting involved with learning American Sign Language and are very excited about that. It seems possible that the use of American Sign Language among deaf people is diminishing, but it seems to be growing in popularity among hearing people. And we're wondering if hearing people will be the new models for American Sign Language. Well, I think that's ironic, isn't it? Um, I would say that the acceptability of ASL being used in the deaf community, remember throughout history, ASL has been oppressed. And for the last 100 years, it's been oppressed. And so in light of that, the leaders of the deaf community have felt that they could not use American Sign Language in formal situations. And it's not, it wasn't intentional, but they felt that way. And remember, they got a lot of feedback to sign more English-like, and, and using American Sign Language was discouraged. And I think that that pressure comes from within the community. Now, the people who are promoting the use of ASL didn't really come from within the community. That, that pressure wasn't from within. In fact, it's from the outside. It's people coming in saying, hey, we like your language. We, we want to see it more. <coughs> now, does that mean that the deaf community is ready to say, fine, let's go out in the open and, and use the language as it really is used? with outsiders and whether people who choose to learn ASL should should be able to do that and you know in fact most of the teachers in education are not so fluent in using sign and I think more hearing people are learning ASL and in fact maybe that may be who are carrying out through the generations Okay, I'm interested in finding out what people in the audience think. And how do you feel about perhaps hearing people taking over the modeling of ASL? Okay, please stand. I 
as I look around the audience, I think there might be less people here than attended last week. And I think perhaps the very topic, American Sign Language, has scared some people off. They've worked so long, so hard to develop English skills that I think it's a threatening topic to some people in the deaf community. And I think you're right, the deaf community tends to use American Sign Language less and less, and it's really growing more and more in the hearing community. So what's the dynamic here? What's really happening in a topic like tonight on cherishing the language ASL? Raises okay. interesting questions. Any other comments, please? Okay. In my opinion, I doubt that American Sign Language will really diminish. My personal opinion, uh, gained throughout my life experience and interaction with the deaf community, is that many deaf people, perhaps 80% of deaf people, uh, about 90% of deaf people are born to hearing parents, and they live out in the community, and as they associate with the community, they start to develop skills in American Sign Language. And I think uh, the amount of deaf people born to deaf parents uh, who are native signers may be less in number. And uh, we are seeing ASL spreading to people who aren't native, and they're using it more and more and more. So I doubt there will be that much diminishing. I think we're seeing more publicity, more written about ASL and a lot more publicity, and perhaps it does relate to financial reasons. Okay, please stand. I tend to disagree. I think hearing people are really eager to learn American Sign Language, and the hypothesis that deaf people are using it less and less and that hearing people will take over as models, I don't really think so. I know a lot more people are, a lot more hearing people are teaching classes in American Sign Language. But I don't think that's really effective. I think the deaf community will uh, continue to use American Sign Language a lot, and I don't think the community is necessarily going to grow smaller. That's an interesting point. You said the expressive use of ASL. Hmm. You and I are both deaf people, and we can use American Sign Language, but when a hearing person communicates with me, I know that it's difficult for me to use American Sign Language. Not impossible, but difficult. I tend to revert toward using more of an English approach to signing. Um, maybe hearing people think they know American Sign Language, but I'm not sure that I like, it seems that you don't like the idea of a hearing person teaching American Sign Language. Yes, is there one, um, one man out there wants to say something? I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, and I came here to visit NTID. And I'd like to mention, I don't think ASL is going to diminish. I think it will maintain the same force. I think you could draw a parallel to the number of American people now learning Spanish, but I don't think they're going to take over that language in any sense. If hearing people are learning sign language, that's fine. But I firmly believe American Sign Language will maintain and Deaf people born in the future will cherish and preserve the language. <coughs> okay, do we have another comment from the audience, please? It's really hard to refrain from speaking right out, but uh, seeing those comments about whether the deaf community is going to grow larger or smaller, and seeing parallels drawn to the use of Spanish in America, I think in some ways, Spanish may be oppressed as well, and Spanish people are encouraged to speak English. We see a lot of oppression in school programs, school districts, related to mainstreaming. I think less and less students are going to residential schools. Maybe it can be preserved through a family transmission of the language, but I think we will see some trends that tend to make it decrease. Do you want to respond to that, Ted? Yes. I. After watching some of these comments, I think the key here is public policy. As the government makes plans for education and where money is being spent, the, the government is using your tax money to spend 
on sign language classes, but for who? Not for you. Not for for deaf people and the ch and the deaf children, but it's for hearing people who are taking sign language classes. And they aren't teaching ASL to deaf children who need to learn it. Do you understand? ASL seems to be just fine to give to hearing adults. <coughs> But to allow deaf children to learn ASL is still not accepted. It's being withheld, and it's really being given to hearing people for the reason of working with the deaf. And, and the reason is that they've found that any other methods haven't really worked, and so they need to use ASL to be able to communicate with deaf people. So. You know, here comes a hearing person who thinks they've learned ASL and has some degree, and then they're out there. There's a new market for hearing people who know ASL, and I feel like, hey, wait a minute. You know, we, you missed the point. We still feel underground. We still feel like our language is underground, and here all these new things have happened. I'm interested in gathering the opinion of the audience. Do you feel that ASL is becoming more widespread and weekly used, uh, more used, or do you feel that it's on the decline? I'd, I'd like a show of hands to see who feels that it's growing in use. <coughs> okay, please put your mm -hmm. hands down. Now, who thinks that ASL is becoming weaker and less used? Only a few. Hmm, that's very interesting. I should also add, I don't think we should worry too much about the future. Instead, we should look back. This all happened a hundred years ago. And in fact, this concern was so great that the National Association of the Deaf, the NAD, was so concerned about the preservation of sign language that they raised funds to produce a film. Okay, could you hold? I, I see that this is an exciting topic, but we need to take a break. So I promise we'll continue with this when we come back. Welcome back. Recently, we were talking about the past hundred years um, and how people were concerned about the changes in ASL. Could you talk about that some more? Well, yes, I was talking about how a hundred years ago, this was a time where sign language was used in the education of deaf children, and this was the tradition brought over from France. And this form of deaf education was used sometime around 1880. And it was thought that, before that, it was thought that deaf children could not use sign language because they could not discuss any abstract notions. And so 
this, I'm sorry, at this time, it was thought that oralism would be a better method, and there was increasing pressure on deaf education to then prohibit sign language from being used, and an increased use of oralism <coughs> began. And this was, again, the time, around 1880, at a world congress of teachers of the deaf in Europe, where, where a mandate was agreed that, oral, that oralism would be the method of deaf education. And there was only one group that voted against that, and that was the American delegation. And when they came back, they, they ha hustled up a lot of ac activism to somehow <coughs> preserve the language. They were worried about the future with this new oralist movement. So they brought together a group of people, some master signers, and filmed their signing in an effort to preserve the language. And now, here after all those years, they they were worried that or they were worried that um, there wouldn't be any sign language used in the schools, and that they would pull out these films a hundred years later and and see that there was sign language used. But in fact, sign language was to survive, and it went underground. And despite hand slapping and and not being allowed to sign, <laughs> ASL survived. <coughs> and e I think even if there are new pressures, it will survive. <coughs> Okay, I do know that some of our audience members are eager to ask some questions. Really related to American Sign Language and the heritage there, uh, where deaf parents have deaf children, that probably is only 10% of the deaf population where we have native signers whose parents are also deaf. And for students who learn sign language, perhaps in college, could we call them native? And we have examples, certainly, of native signing from the videotapes you've mentioned and see examples of the preservation. But I think we need to encourage that, where parents are able to pass on and transmit the language to their children. But we have this, uh, this discouragement of that in the school system. How do we make all that fit? Okay, are you saying that <coughs> the 10 percent who um, are native users are from deaf parents and, hmm. Well, I think, yes, that's, that's the question, but I think you're worried that if it's just this 10 percent who are transmitting the language from generation to generation, is that enough? Or can the language continue with such a small group of native users? <coughs> well, you're right that if there are deaf parents who present the language to their children. Those children will be native, I'm saying the term speakers, but I mean native signers. Just, I mean, parallel this to any spoken language situation where you learn it from home, that's your native language. Now, many deaf people do not have <coughs> ASL as their native language, and their parents are hearing. And the first time they see ASL is maybe at the school l years later when they, or, or, or through some <coughs> other situation where they meet deaf people. And it's those children of the deaf children of hearing parents who learn <coughs> the language from the deaf children of deaf parents. But <coughs> my concern is look at the mainstream situation where children are mainstreamed into, deaf children are mainstreamed into hearing public schools and day programs. Wh how can ASL uh, come into this situation? If there's no deaf children of deaf parents in, in the mainstream uh, setting, how will these deaf children ever get exposed to ASL? <coughs> and in fact, research has shown that without this channel, these children still are signing something that looks like ASL. And in fact, the, you ask the teachers and they say, the children are signing something different. We're not sure what it is. And in <coughs> fact, some of the research that's come out of, of our lab has shown that 
ASL has contaminated, we can say, the classroom. <laughs> and how that's happened is you can find uh, one of the children in this class may have gone to a summer camp, and at that summer camp was a, a deaf child who had gone to the residential school where ASL was, and, and it's through these other channels that ASL gets transmitted. And even if the child um, leaves that day program, they mm. leave this, the language there, ASL there. And so, but let me tell you about the case where there is no ASL contamination and but you still find that these children are signing different differently than their teachers or their parents and in fact they're signing it's not really ASL but its structure seems to look more like ASL in fact it, it what I want to say is it looks like ASL it's not ASL but it, its form looks similar and and the children are are evolving this language. <coughs> okay, you're speaking of native signers, and you explained some of the characteristics. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. Native signers, a native signer means a person who has acquired the language mm -hmm. from their parents. Uh, whatever that language is, whether it's English or American Sign Language or another language, it's acquired naturally in the home. But when you talk about a native ASL signer, I mean, is a, is a person native in ASL? What are the general characteristics of a native signer that we could easily see? So we could see more that this person is native. Okay, well, first of all, and the term native signer can apply to a user of ASL, a user of Japanese sign language, a user of any foreign sign language. That's what we mean by a native signer. What I mean here is that a child grows up in a situation where they acquire the language from their parents. Their parents are signers, and they learn it directly from their parents. And it's in the same fashion that hearing children learn a spoken language from their parents, a natural <coughs> acquisition situation. That's the, the, the strict sense of the word native. But now, you're asking about this notion of native ASL. Well, we can say, we can compare native ASL to native Japanese sign language, but we, we don't have native signed English signer. We don't have any person like that. It, there has to be generations involved. And so it's usually the case that it's hearing people who have deaf children who discover they have a deaf child and then they go and they learn as much sign as they can, but it's still not like modeling a, a natural sign language because they're usually signing and speaking at the same time. And the issue here is whether they learn the language naturally, automatically, in, in the acquisition situation. Okay. I just thought of something related to um, cultural issues. We have the example of the Eskimo in Alaska who has 48 different words for the um, concept of snow. You know, we have one word to indicate snow, but the Eskimo has 48. You know, perhaps one kind of snow is, is best used for building igloos, or, you know, it may have the characteristic characteristic of being very sticky and, and will stick together and, and uh, then there may be other varieties of snow, drier or whatever. That's similar to American Sign Language where often we have several signs that go with, you know, one word in English. I think you've made this point to address 
some concern in the community that ASL is, is a weaker language. It doesn't really have the expansive vocabulary that we see in English, and ASL is limited. But really, no one has counted the number of signs we have in ASL. And then on the other hand, someone will say, well, there's all of these signs that match one English word. Let's use the example of run, R-U-N. In English, you can have several meanings of the word run, but it uses the same form, R-U-N, run. But there can be many different signs that that will okay, match that. Okay, could you give us a list of some of the signs used for the word run? Well, if you gave me the word run, R-U-N, I'd, I'd say, well, you know, I'm not exactly sure what you mean. I, I need to give you, it's the same as the Eskimo who says, what's your word for snow? And I'll say, well, or the Eskimo would have to say, well, what exactly do you mean? Do you mean snow good for dogs, or what do you mean? And then they would be able to give you the appropriate translation. And I think that's just a fact about languages <coughs> in general. In, in one language, you may have several words or for one <coughs> word in another language. Okay, so American Sign Language has many strengths. Um, and sometimes it may have only one sign for a few different words in English, but it's because we don't need that. Well, I don't think we want to say that, well, ASL is okay, it, there's enough and there's a way to do it. There are other ways. Okay, we need another message from our sponsor. Come back and join us again. Hello, and welcome back. Uh, I know some people in our audience would like to make some comments. Could we have some comments now, please? Related to teaching class, I know that often hearing teachers who are instructing ASL uh, may not have the same goals of preserving the language. I wonder how protectionist we should be in terms of protecting our language. You mean, well, when I see your statement, I'm wondering if you mean that um, uh, we may lose power because hearing people are teaching sign language instead of deaf people? Well, I think we're feeling a, a bit concerned about what the consequences are about other people learning mm. ASL. And I think it has to do more with how the system works. Let me clarify. Let's say a college wants to hire a teacher. They'll publicize that for a sign language instructor, and then they interview candidates. And what do they do? Um, blah, 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 blah. You know, they don't know sign, and, and they're just interviewing in English, and, and they can't quite do the interview, and so then they get a candidate who's hearing, and suddenly they get a nice rapport going, and what happens? They hire the hearing candidate. And so the deaf candidate says, hmm, darn it. So, I mean, that's, that's a disadvantage, I think, with, in the hiring process. 
the important point here is that as a deaf candidate, you have to show that you have the qualifications, but you also have to emphasize that you also have the skill. <coughs> and there has to be some procedure for certification. So if the position advertises that it should be a certified instructor, then there's no more problem because you would be certified. <coughs> point was just, I just thought of a point. Um, when you see ASL, you know that there are rules. Some people think that there aren't, but they're internal almost. They're visual. Can they, can someone who doesn't understand the rules be a good sign language teacher? Well, I think if we compare a person who has an innate understanding, intuition about the language. The person knows how to sign ASL, but they may not know the rules in, in an official sense. I mean, they, have, they would have to go and take a course and study the structure of the language. And, and so what happens is that the hearing candidate ends up being able to explain in the linguistics, the structure of the language. and. Ex Expressively? Well, I think it will look like the person, the deaf person is fluent in the language, but I think that maybe we could get these two people to work together. I mean, we'll have somebody who would be fluent in sign and could teach the language and then have the hearing instructor say, see, this is what it's like, see, this is what it's like. There's someone out here in the audience who's a question. Okay. <coughs> I guess not. So, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, you gave a, a paper at a conference and presented using American Sign Language. <coughs> and you used that for your formal presentation. And I'm wondering, were your colleagues and peers shocked, you know, hearing people? What did they have to say about your presenting mm. in ASL? Well, I would say that was 12 years ago, I think. <coughs> and, and where was that? That was here in Rochester. I, I was in California at the time. I went to graduate school in California. And I had written a paper that I submitted to this conference, which in fact was the first conference for sign language researchers. And it was held here in Rochester. And I submitted a paper and I was invited <coughs> to present this paper and I worked so hard at preparing for this talk and I stood up and gave my talk and then suddenly all of these people approached me and said, oh, you, you weren't supposed to do that. And, and I realized that I, I hadn't really ever been told that I couldn't use ASL. I had gone through my college career using interpreters. I had done everything on my own. And I didn't go through the, the normal channels where, uh, where deaf people end up, you know, <laughs> meeting or having pressures to conform to a different style of signing. And, and so I'm glad I didn't, actually. I see. OK, we have another question in the audience. I'd like to tie this in with a little bit on a discussion of spoken foreign languages. Last summer I was in Denmark and Sweden, and boy, it was really interesting for me. I wish I knew more about their signed languages there, and I think they potentially could have some influence on American Sign Language, where we could do some lexical borrowing there, where perhaps instead of borrowing from English, we could borrow some of the concepts and terminologies in, like any language does, but from those other signed languages. Do you think it's possible that sort of thing had happen? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. I think that that's the way it should be done. I mean, it's fine to invent a, a new sign from within the language, but it's, it's, it should be accepted to borrow a sign from another 
foreign sign language. And <coughs> researchers who work on ASL um, are now becoming interested in, in foreign sign languages and, and interested in inviting foreign signers here to share. And I think your community should support that. So ASL can perhaps grab the flavor of other different languages and incorporate them. Do you know that Italian borrowed a lot of signs from another language? I, there's a sign for garlic, and I borrowed that from the Italian sign language because we've always had to fingerspell it because we don't have a sign here. That's one idea. That's a, one example. I know that in the past you worked with the chimp that became famous, whose name was Washoe, and when you taught him American Sign Language, what were your feelings about that? Well, first let me make clear, I didn't work with Washoe. Washoe had retired from uh, the research project, but the same group of researchers decided to start with a new generation of chimpanzees, and here I was fresh out of grad school, and I was ready to uh, devote my life to science and <laughs> work with chimps. I thought this would be great. I could teach, provide ASL. I'd be, uh, I was a better signer than them anyway, and I could teach them to sign. And there's, this has a very interesting result. First of all, let me point out that these other researchers in the project did not know ASL, and they really had looked in books and dictionaries and tried to sign and teach these chimps to sign. And, you know, really, at that point, the, the chimps had understood as much sign language as a dog does. I mean, they were basically equivalent to dogs. <coughs> but you have a question to add to that, I believe. Well, teaching ASL to chimps, um, do you think that they could ever be native users of, of that language? Well, at the time that I took this position, I knew that deaf people were feeling that, uh, you know, feeling a bit <laughs> insulted that they were teaching signs to these uh, stupid chimpanzees and they felt their intelligence was insulted that, you know, sign language could be taught to anything that was dumb and uh, but really it was uh, a scientific question they wanted to know if you know since since chimpanzees don't have an appropriate <coughs> vocal tract to produce spoken language they made an effort to teach sign language just to see if it could use language that really bothers me that science has taken that on science is encouraging chimpanzees to learn ASL and in school children, in residential schools, they're not allowed to, to learn ASL. They should be taught English. They should be taught how to speak. That really bothers me. Does that bother you? Does that bother the studio audience? Well, yes, it bothers me. Yes, I, I see some nods out in the audience. When you and I met previously, um, <coughs> It seemed that hearing people and deaf people were influencing each other's cultures. Is it okay then to assume that ASL users can be influenced by native English users? Well, I think this case happens in any situation where there are two languages in contact. You can't you can't stop it and I think most of the people here are bilingual. We know ASL and we also know English, but we, you know, I, 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 can, I can use ASL when I want, and sometimes if I want to use English, I can, and, and I have the choice, and I think, you know, we're bilingual and we can do that, but I, I think it's important that we draw the line for instruction because we need to make clear what's ASL and what's English <coughs> for teaching purposes. You mentioned that to get ahead, to continue our culture, you know, right now we have a very small amount of people who, who know American Sign Language, who are native users, and we should not disclude 
hearing people and people who are in the educational system, that we could include some of those people in, that can use ASL. Well, yes, I think that we see this happening in the deaf community. Um, I think some of the work that I do can help deaf people to understand more about their language and in turn teach it to others. Really, I feel inspired by our discussion of American Sign Language today. Unfortunately, we need to conclude our program, and so we need to thank our sponsors. Many thanks to our guest, Dr. Ted Sapala, for giving us an idea and, and helping us think more about our language, preserving and understanding our culture and our language. Thank you so much. And also, thanks to Brenda Aaron. I really enjoyed working with you. And of course, I want to give a special thanks to our studio audience who shared your comments and questions. Thank you to everyone. Uh -huh.